In a city that was once a haven for abolitionists and that had outlawed segregated schools in 1855, Boston in the 1970s was the site of racial tension and chaos that the city had never before seen. Boston's public schools were deeply segregated even years after the Supreme Court ruled against separate education for blacks and whites. The problem of desegregation became a violent clash of rights. African Americans had the right to an equal education, while whites felt that they had the right to send their kids to their local schools with their neighbors. All of the authority figures in Boston had a responsibility to help the desegregation process. However, the NAACP and the courts proved to be the only ones that upheld this responsibility to advance blacks' rights, while local politicians such as Louise Day Hicks instead spoke out against busing and led whites in the resistance. The push for desegregating the nation's schools came with the Brown v. Topeka Board of Education case of 1954. The NAACP, or National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, had a responsibility to fight for equal educational opportunities for African Americans. It filed a suit in Supreme Court against the Topeka Board of Education, which had engaged in court-ordered segregation. Chief Justice Earl Warren and the court spoke in a unanimous decision that court-ordered segregation was and always would be unconstitutional and violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The court ordered the states to integrate their schools with all deliberate speed. In Boston, 11 years after Brown, one in four students was black, but there were many schools where they made up the majority of the population. The Boston NAACP brought the racial imbalance of the schools into the public eye. We just wanted them to say, yes, there was segregation in the schools, and we wanted them to acknowledge that the problem exists and to commit themselves to do something about it. That year, Governor Volpe developed the Racial Imbalance Act, which outlawed schools with more than 50% minority in order the school committee to come up with a plan for desegregation and implement it immediately or lose state funding. But this was ignored by the Boston School Committee, led by Louise Day Hicks, which did everything in his power to make sure desegregation did not happen. She sided with her colleagues and their South Boston and Charlestown neighbors against busing. Many of the Negro parents believe that a predominantly Negro school is inferior per se, but we in here in Boston do not believe that premise. To rally the anti-busers, she created an organization called ROAR, Restore Our Alienated Rights, which led marches through the city and organized boycotts of the schools. Hicks and her fellow school committee members found ways to stall desegregation efforts. For years they constructed portable classrooms at white high schools to handle surplus population instead of sending white students to under-enrolled black schools. And they created feeder schools that kept white students in white neighborhoods and black students in black neighborhoods. Their actions sent a message to the community. In 1974, in a suit filed by the Boston NAACP, Judge W. Arthur Garrity ruled that the Boston School Committee was guilty of obstructing efforts to integrate Boston schools. Because the school committee had failed to develop a plan themselves, Garrity was forced to implement an immediate solution, the Massachusetts State Board of Education's master plan of force busing across the city to bring the Boston schools into racial balance. And the Boston School Committee was given an order, develop and implement its own permanent solution to desegregation and bring the Boston schools in line with the law. Through the actions of Judge Garrity and the Boston NAACP, it appeared that African American students were a step closer to realizing their right to an equal education. But with phase one of the desegregation plan underway, were they really better off than before forced busing took effect? Phase one of forced busing turned out to be anything but a solution. Racial tensions escalated to dangerous levels. 18 school buses were destroyed. Roar led boycotts and marches in the city to protest Garrity's decision. The National Guard and state police were called to assist Boston police in holding back the crowds. I was the first one off the bus on top of that hill in South Boston. When I got off that bus, I was called a nigger. Nigger, get back on that bus by a Boston police officer. They started throwing golf balls, bricks at the bus. It was so much noise. Calling your spare checker, go back to Africa. We don't want you over here. Mayor Kevin White and law enforcement were unable to keep order. Protesting crowds aside, there were other pressures on Boston's top political, civil, and community officials. Kevin White was born in the West Roxbury neighborhood of Boston, which was predominantly white Irish Catholic and the home base of anti-busing organization Roar. 
He won the Boston mayoral election over Louise Day Hicks in 1967 and had political ambitions to hold his position for many terms, as other Irish Catholic politicians had done. However, the Boston busing crisis put this in jeopardy. White knew that supporting and enforcing the integration of the schools had labeled him a traitor among neighbors and friends. I think that there were people on the city council, colleagues of mine, who didn't have a bigoted bone in their body, who were scared to death politically, and felt they had no choice except to follow the mob. In 1974, he formed an alliance with Louise Day Hicks, his former mayoral opponent. Hicks promoted White's candidacy to anti-busters and encouraged their support, while White allowed Hicks to use City Hall as a gathering place for anti-busing rallies. He felt having an ongoing conversation with Louise was a way to figure out what was going on on the other side. White's partnership with Hicks and her supporters put the Boston lawmakers in a compromising position. Could they really enforce desegregation while also giving a voice to the opposing side? As for the police, many of them were natives of South Boston and Charlestown, neighbors at the center of forced busing for white students, and where desegregation was firmly opposed. They were expected to protect students of every race while they were transported to and from school. But unfortunately, there were instances where violence went unchecked, and the police themselves were guilty of racial abuse against minority students. A year after the State Board of Education's forced busing plan went into effect, phase two of the busing plan was developed. Judge Garrity had reviewed and rejected a Boston School Committee recommendation for achieving desegregation, deeming it ineffective at balancing the school. The new plan, developed by a court-ordered team of experts, called for more busing and reassigning students once again, but also created citizen participation groups to monitor the carrying out of desegregation court orders in the Boston public schools. At this point, Judge Garrity became de facto superintendent of Boston schools, responsible for everything from the hiring and firing of faculty to determining how many basketballs a school needed. This time, Judge Garrity was determined that racial integration would happen peacefully. But this year can and it must be different. For what really is at stake this fall is simply this. The safety of our children and the survival of this city. By this time, local protesters realized that fighting back was not going to reverse Judge Gary's decision for desegregation. Time had not fully healed the wounds. The trauma of the Boston busing crisis was deep and that changed the city forever. During Garrity's tenure as de facto superintendent, the public school enrollment lessened from 93,000 to 57,000, and the proportion of white students shrank from 65% of total enrollment to 28%. A white flight movement swept through the city as 20,000 white students left the public schools between September 1974 and 1976 because their families wanted to avoid the violence of the crisis, or because the families realized that fighting Judge Garrity's ruling wasn't going to do anything. 78 schools such as Roxbury High had to close their doors because there weren't enough students due to the white flight. The schools also had catastrophic test scores. On average, SAT takers in the city's high schools scored an 845 out of 1600. The Boston busing crisis also brought the era of Irish dominance in Boston politics to an end as African Americans such as John O'Brien were elected to public office and more opportunities for blacks arose in the city. Looking back on the busing crisis, many believe that busing was a poor remedy for desegregation. I think there could have been a much more uh, gradual, moderate, limited, use whatever word you'd like to use, plan. That, in my opinion, would have been constitutional, uh, would have uh, struck down some of the worst parts of the segregated system the city was operating. The Boston busing crisis was so inflammatory because it seemed to be a conflict of rights. Blacks believed they had the right to an equal education while whites believed they had the right to go to their local school with local students. The NAACP and Judge Garrity took on the responsibility of providing an equal education for blacks and a safe environment for all students, which leaders like Louise Day Hicks and Mayor Kevin White failed to live up to. The conflict led to violence in the streets. In the end, the Boston busing crisis damaged the city and busing failed to integrate Boston schools. The end result was no different than what had started. And all we had was a very different city with tens of thousands of fewer children, 30, 40, 50,000 fewer people than 10 years prior. And I'm not confident whether the result of the way black children were educated was any better than when we started off. Hey!